with us this morning to review the Sunday papers are author and broadcaster Emma Wolfe and Nigel Nelson, the Sunday Mirror's political editor. Uh, very good morning to you both. Thanks so much uh, for joining us at this early hour. Uh, Nigel, to you first, uh, if I may, you've um, pulled out the front of the Sunday Times today, which leads with uh, the report into uh, BBC chairman Richard Sharp, this scandal rumbling on for him after you know several weeks now. Yes, and, and it is a damning report too. Um, and what the Culture Committee says is that he made uh, significant errors of judgment by not declaring at his pre-appointment hearing before them that he'd helped Boris Johnson secure an £800,000 loan. Um, the, the government also comes in for a bit of a pasting here, that they, that they also criticise Rishi Sunak, um, who, def who defended Richard Sharp saying that everything must be fine because uh, the appointment process uh, went through the committee in the first place. Well, of course, we don't know that had the committee uh, realised what Richard Sharp had been up to, whether they would have actually approved him. The report doesn't go, go as far as to say uh, they wouldn't, uh, but Labour has, has jumped in on that one, uh, with Lucy Powell, the Shadow Culture Secretary, saying that um, his position at the BBC BBC is now untenable. Yeah, certainly. Uh, it's not looking good for him, the fact that this is still uh, being discussed all these weeks on. Uh, the front page of the Sunday Telegraph, Emma, a uh, really interesting story about British weapons being potentially made in Ukraine. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so it turns out that senior UK defence officials are discussing plans with their counterparts in Kyiv um, to start manufacturing uh, weaponry, British weaponry and heavy vehicle, um, military heavy vehicles in Ukraine. Um, it's being seen as a significant strengthening of our sort of close relationship with um, Ukraine. Obviously, we have Britain has a cl very close relationship. We saw President Zelensky's visit this week, a very powerful address to Westminster Hall. And, you know, we're coming up to the first anniversary, a key moment, the first anniversary of the Russian invasion. Um, and the reason this matters, this potential of manufacturing weapons in Ukraine, it would, it, it's seen as a significant strengthening, not only of that relationship, but also a sign of Ukraine and NATO. Um, you know, y y Ukraine deepening their own ties with NATO and with the general kind of European security um, system. So, yeah, we'll watch this space. And obviously, it may well be that um, until hostilities are over, no, no manufacture of this, of this kind can take place anyway, you know, purely because of infrastructure and things like that. The other interesting point, I think, is, is how this is seen by Russia. Um, obviously, deals to make Western arms are likely to be seen as provocation by Moscow. But I think at this stage, pretty much anything that the West does is seen as provocative, um, antagonistic by, by President Putin. So, yeah, it's a case of, of seeing how those talks go and, and watch this space. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, the ongoing concern at being escalation. Uh, the front page of The Observer, uh, Nigel, really interesting story about a cross-party summit uh, regarding the failings of Brexit. What, what's all this about? Yeah, this is, uh, this is fascinating. This happened on um, uh, Thursday and Friday, and it was senior politicians, past and present, who gathered to discuss the future of Brexit. Um, so you had the likes of um, uh, Brexiteer Tory Michael Gove there. Uh, there was the Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy, Shadow Defence Secretary John Healy, and Peter Mandelson, who was chairing it. Uh, business leaders turned up as well, and basically they were talking about how they're going to actually make Brexit work, because it's not working as well as it should at the moment. Uh, I do think the most significant part of this meeting is the fact that um, it took place at all with senior Labour politicians, and it seems to knock down the idea that uh, keeps rumbling around that uh, a Labour government would somehow take Britain out of... Uh, 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 sorry, would reverse Brexit and take Britain back into Europe. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Brexit is here to stay, whether you're a Remainer or a Leaver. Uh, we've just got to get on with it. Yeah, well, certainly very interesting that uh, three years after leaving, they're still uh, talking about all the problems unfolding after Brexit. Uh, another story on the front page of the Sunday Times that you've pulled out, uh, Emma, uh, the Tavistock Clinic, of course, that 
that treats children with gender dysphoria, uh, more, more common there on, on, on various scandals surrounding their medicalization of children. Yeah, so there's a new book coming out from a senior investigative journalist um, about the highly controversial service within the, ta the Tavistock, Tavistock and Portman NHS Trust, North London Clinic. Um, this is a service, the Gender Identity Development Service, and we've heard lots about this over the past year or so, about the treatment here and about the treatment of children, minors, um, for gender dysphoria or for, for transitioning, all of that. But, I mean, the revelations in this book are quite astonishing. More than a third of the young people who were treated at the gender identity service uh, had autistic, severe to moderate autistic traits, and in the general population, that's 2%. So these were obviously very, very troubled children. There were some incredibly complex children, and that's her words, not mine, incredibly complex children who were placed on medication after just one appointment, one face-to-face -face appointment. And this medication is puberty blockers, cross-hormone treatment, this kind of stuff, you know, sometimes irreversible medical treatment. Um, children as young as three, Sally, children as young as three were referred to this service, having changed their name or decided that they were a different gender or that they were no gender at all. Um, and I think that really there are huge questions still to be answered by the Tavistock. Um, obviously, the service is being closed, it's being wound up now. Um, but I think this feeds into the debate, the huge debate that we're having at the moment about trans issues in general, but also about the treatment of children and those, you know, below the age of consent. Yeah, uh, certainly, as you say, it is, it is a huge talking point uh, in the current climate. Um, Nigel, the front page of the Sunday People, this is actually on the front page of a couple of the newspapers this morning, uh, about uh, the closure of hundreds of GP surgeries. Yeah, as if, as if problems facing us trying to get a GP appointment weren't bad enough. Um, here's yet another one with one in ten surgeries, according to uh, uh, to a survey, uh, reducing their hours because they can't afford to heat the place. Now, um, uh, some some doctors are even talking about pulling out of the NHS altogether, and they're getting staff to wear sweaters when they come in, uh, so they can keep the heating down. But obviously, this could be, a, you know, this is a real crisis for primary care. And without primary care as the, the gatekeepers for the whole, of the whole of the NHS, the whole system falls apart. So this could be really serious. And the important thing is to try and keep, uh, retain GPs. It may be the answer is they should stop being uh, businessmen with all the paperwork that entails. And some would prefer to go back to being salaried rather like hospital consultants are. Right, and we cannot uh, do this paper review without talking about the front page of the Daily Star, Emma, just briefly. Um, okay, Britain's you. nudists uh, facing a cost of stripping crisis. I'm just going to steal Nigel's line there. The cost of stripping crisis yeah, exactly. for Britain's nudists. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, cost of living. So naturists are very worried about the cost of stripping crisis <laughs> um, because their homes are too cold to whip their kit off. Apparently it's way too nippy to do the full Monty. Um, and the only place they can flash the flesh <laughs> is under the duvet. They're, gonna have, they're having to put on dressing gowns and socks and stay warm that way, which to most of us, dressing gowns and socks sounds like heaven, but there we go. And on that one, Nigel. Uh, obviously, on, on a serious note, you know, the cost of living crisis, you know, is, is a major, major issue for so many people this year. Yeah, isn't it just? But um, we're now going to have signs going up on nudist colonies, which will be saying, closed until further notice. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Well, listen, um, thank you both so much uh, for joining us this morning. Nigel Nelson, Emma Wolfe, it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much. Have a great Sunday. Thanks. Still to come, still to come on Sky News Breakfast, uh, we will be joining Kay Burley uh, live in Turkey for the latest from Turkey and Syria as the number of dead climb to more than 28,000 lives lost, a few survivors still being found at more than five, six days on, uh, but certainly hopes are diminishing. And Kay will be live this morning from San Liurfa in Turkey with all the latest. Do stay tuned for that.